Okay, hello everyone, and welcome to another NeurX webinar. Uh, my name is Andrew, and I will be moderating uh, today's uh, session. It's really a pleasure to welcome Dr. Yalda Shahriari uh, who, from the University of Rhode Island, who will be speaking to us today about modality fusion EGF news conversions for deeper dive into auditory processing. So if this is your first time joining one of our webinars, welcome. And if you are one of our users, thank you for your continued support. Uh, so to, just to tell you a little bit about our company. So for the last 20 years or so, NeurX has been designing and manufacturing state-of-the-art FNIR systems that are user-friendly and powerful for NEARS research. Uh, we focus on providing researchers with training and support and a collaborative resource environment um, so you can focus on your research. And this webinar is an example of that effort. Our FNIR solutions are all manufactured in Berlin and they're distributed worldwide by our team of uh, consultants. You're welcome to connect with us on social media. We're available on various platforms, and you can also subscribe to our newsletters where you can hear about the latest product features and releases, uh, features, uh, you know, featured research uh, from some of our users, and of course, a bunch of other exciting news. And we promise not to bombard you with a lot of emails, so we only email a few times uh, a year. So a few housekeeping points. Uh, everybody on this call will be muted. Questions are welcome at any time, and we encourage you to use the Zoom chat function and we will take questions at the end of the webinar. The content will be made available in the upcoming days on our website. And if we don't get to answer all the questions today, we will follow up with you. And if you have any other questions or feedback for us, you can always reach, reach us at consulting at or support at nearx.net. Joining me today is our wonderful marketing and event coordinator, Cami. Cami is making sure everything is running smoothly behind the scenes, so thanks, Cami. And without further ado, it's my pleasure uh, to welcome and introduce Dr. Yalda Shahriari. Uh, Dr. Shahriari is an associate professor in engineering and the director of neural lab uh, at the University of Rhode Island. Her research interests are biomedical signal processing, brain computer interface for assistive technology, statistical analysis and modeling, machine learning algorithms, healthcare units, and biomedical data analysis. Uh, Dr. Shahriari accomplished her uh, postdoctoral studies at the University of California in San Francisco, and she completed her PhD in biomedical engineering at the Old Dominion University. Uh, she also has her Master's of Science in Biomedical Engineering from Iran, from the Iranian University of Science and Technology, and a Bachelor of, of Science in Electrical Engineering from the uh, Ferdowsi University in Iran. Uh, Dr. Shahrer is the recipient of multiple prestigious uh, awards, including the National Science Foundation Award, uh, Rhode Island um, and the Rhode Island Idea Network of Biomedical uh, Research Excellence. She's a professional member of the Brain Computer Interface Society, Society for Neuroscience, IEEE Engineering and Medicine and Biology, and the IEEE Signal Processing Society. Uh, so without further ado, Dr. Shahriari, I'll pass you the virtual mic and uh, thanks again for joining us. Okay, hello everyone. Can you hear me? <laughs> Perfect. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Kemi, for inviting me. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, just very briefly, uh, I'm Yalda Shahriari again. I'm an associate professor of biomedical engineering, director of neural processing and control lab at the University of Rhode Island. Just a little bit about the background of my lab is that within past several years, my lab research has been primarily focused on multimodal neuroimaging techniques, uh, specifically on EEG and FNIRs. Uh, my talk today will focus on multimodal techniques, but on auditory data set that we have been collecting for the past several years uh, through a collaborative work uh, funded by National Science Foundation in collaboration with Harvard, Brown University, and UMass Dartmouth. Here is my lab. Uh, there have been multiple alumni since I joined URI, and I built my lab back in 2017, and I currently have multiple graduate students and a postdoc. Uh, all of them working towards multimodal techniques. So, sorry, today, Dr. Uh, Dr. Shariari, sorry to interrupt you. We cannot see your screen. Do you mind sharing your screen again with us, please? Uh, you don't see my screen? No, we don't. Uh, oh. Um, I thought we checked for that. Uh, I don't know, maybe, um, let me see. 
Can you see now? Yes, that's perfect. Okay. So sorry. So let, yeah. me, let me go back to the previous slide. Here is my lab. <laughs> so yeah, these are basically my lab members that are working all on uh, multimodal techniques. I have had multiple graduate students and undergrads all kind of graduated. Uh, they, they have been working on multimodal techniques as well. Sometimes they are more interested in FNIRs. I let them work with FNIRs. Sometimes they're more interested in EEG. But the point is like con combining these two. So that's basically our goal in the lab. Uh, OK, so the first part of uh, my talk today is uh, on uh, characterizing the hemodynamic and electrical signatures of auditory uh, processing. Uh, and the second uh, part of the same research aim is to explore the nonlinear interactions between a slow hemodynamic activities and fast oscillatory activities of EEG uh, through phase amplitude coupling analysis that I will be talking in more details. And in the second phase of my talk, I want to introduce FNIRS net that I'm very excited about that we have been developing for the past several months in my lab. And uh, it is a multi-view spatial-temporal convolutional neural network. Uh, the goal is for fusing data from different perspectives and different views that I will be talking uh, in more detail today. So in multimodal neuroimaging field, obviously we are dealing with different dynamics specifications. And while merging these dynamics can uh, provide a real unique opportunity for us to observe, combine, learn complementary features, specifications, signatures, and in general benefits from uh, multiple sources of information from the same regional neural activities, we have to be careful in terms of data acquisition, experimental design, and data analysis because we are combining two different uh, modalities, uh, two different dynamics, and we have to be very meticulous in terms of like montage selection, signal quality, and experimental design, data analysis, and so on and so forth. So I will be mentioning some of them today, but uh, these are basically these are the challenges. Uh, before going to the challenges, I want to uh, say that. The portability is very important point about combining EEG and FNIRs together. So I remember when I joined URI back in 2016, we got funded in 2017, and uh, the goal was developing a multimodal brain computer interface for uh, patients as assistive technologies for patients with amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. So if you know, uh, these patients basically they have mobility issues and uh, a lot of time it's hard for them to commute, to come, for example, to my lab. And uh, it was hard for us to get data from these patients. But the good thing about the EEG and FNIRS was combining this together, uh, putting them together in the same, I, I remember we had a luggage that we used to carry so it was, it was pretty fine. So it worked out well. And we could actually put everything in the same luggage, carry, and we did it for years. And thankfully, we got uh, many data from patients with ALS, very va valuable and unique data, both longitudinally and non-longitudinally from related to different types of tasks and uh, neural activities. But the point here is the portability is a very important uh, plus for merging these two modalities together. Another one is the, another uh, feature is the cost. So EEG is pretty cost effective, FNIRS compared with other imaging like fMRI, which also records the vascular uh, dynamics uh, is pretty cost effective. Uh, and overall compatibility, they go well with each other. However, as I mentioned, the challenges is the one of them is the montage selection. So depending on the region of interest that we are uh, interested in recording the neural dynamics, uh, we have to carefully design the montage in a way that, for example, a lot of time, you know, for example, for in my lab, we are working with wet EEG that does need injection of the gel conductance and uh, FMIRS cables are pretty bulky and sometimes they can interfere with each other. So we have to kind of be careful while we are interested in recording from the same region of interest. We don't want to have disruptions in signal quality. And experimental design is another important 
uh, components of our studies. So we have to understand that we are dealing with two different dynamics and we want to evoke both a slow and fast oscillatory activities at the same time simultaneously. So this experimental design needs to be meticulously uh, planned in a way that can evoke both responses efficiently and simultaneously at the same time. So uh, about the artifact, I don't want to go into artifact, different types of artifact, but probably most of you know that the EEG is very vulnerable to uh, movement artifact, it's vulnerable to muscle artifacts. FNIRS has its own, own problem. So it's like a, a lot of uh, a slow oscillatory activity, physiological artifacts can contaminate FNIRS. Specifically, again, I don't want to go through these kind of artifacts and artifact removal, but what we did for our study was uh, we focused on respiration artifacts and extracerebral activities that I will be talking uh, shortly. Uh, so these two types of artifacts were uh, those types of um, basically uh, noises that we kind of uh, found uh, of affecting our model, and therefore we developed uh, an artifact removal model to get rid of these two types of artifacts. So very briefly about the background of our study, when we um, de started developing our auditory protocol, we observed that uh, when we de did the recording of the data, so we observed that there was like about 0.2-0.25 hertz oscillatory activity that we were observing in our, our uh, FNIRS data. And we kind of got suspicious that is that can be a respiration artifact. And then yes, when uh, in the separate uh, experimental protocol, when we did an auxiliary recording of the respiration artifact, uh, we observed yes, there is a, a, an interference from the respiration to our FNIRS data that I will be later on talking. And you see the beautiful effect of respiration on actually making uh, a lot of. Uh, could be dangerous actually it could be dangerous in terms of making a lot of like fake uh conclusion about the coupling between the eeg and fmirs so anyways one of the artifacts that we started the uh, uh, monitoring was the the respiration and the other one was the short um uh, through short channel uh, short separation channel uh, in which that if you are familiar, probably you're familiar. So we the idea is if the original source and detector are locating, for example, three centimeter from each other. So this detector is detecting both cerebral and extracerebral or unwanted activities at the same time. And the idea is placing a short channel detector in between about like 1.5 centimeter from the original source. Uh, so the light does not have enough time to travel through the cere uh, cerebral cortex. And therefore, the, the activity that is being recorded by this detector is mostly extracerebral activity. And then through a regression model, we can regress out the extracerebral activity and therefore we can have access to the filter and correct um, data. But what's the problem about this? So this has been used actually for several years, but the problem about this, while this is a common approach, uh, this, does, this approach does not take into account any uh, time lag um, in, uh, between the short channel and long channel uh, data. So back in 2020, Wound Movement Group uh, developed a, a method called temporally embedded canonical correlation analysis, which kind of trying to find a space that maximize the correlation between the artifactual and the data, the artifactual component and the data. And then that's basically hypothetically the space that uh, has the most artifactual component. And therefore we can get rid of the, uh, most of the artifact through this algorithm. So this algorithm, in this algorithm, we have the long channel data, which is Y, and Z is the short channel data. That the good part about this algorithm, you can give other auxiliary physiological uh, data. For us, for our case, it was uh, respiration that we gave to, the, uh, to this algorithm. And therefore, we estimated our weights, which were the, the uh, spaces and the filter coefficients and identified the space that maximized this correlation. And therefore, through a generalized linear model or GLM, uh, we uh, wanted to 
basically get rid of that object artifactual component. So the way that we constructed the design matrix, a part of this design matrix was coming through the, the noise dense regressors from the TCCA algorithm. And a part was the desired uh, response that was a result of convolution of a canonical uh, hemodynamic response function with a vector representing the task design, which uh, is supposed to be the desired hemodynamic response. So we have two basically parts. One is the desired response and one is undesired or the, the artifactual components. So if we have this assumption, we can kind of separate out this G beta uh, into two different terms of functional and physi uh, physiological systematic noise. And therefore, estimating only the beta for the noise uh, components, we can uh, get rid of, through a subtraction, we can get rid of that noise component and therefore have the corrected data. Uh, or filtered data. So the good thing about this is actually take into account any sort of potential lags between the short channel and long channel or long channel and other physiological artifacts. So here you can see um, the long uh, channel HBO2 with blue and with red is the predicted value which pretty uh, pretty fit well into the actual one. This is just to test if our model is has been built uh, properly. And just to say, it's interesting just to see, oh yeah, the, there is really not much error. There you can see error, there are some, but pretty much uh, fit well into each other. Okay, so this was a little background about the type of artifact removal we did, but let's not get too distracted and dive into the, the main uh, analysis. So uh, as I mentioned, uh, we the focus was auditory response. So the, the, I will be talking about healthy participants here in my talk, but just to give you some idea about the background back in 2019 and 20, when we were working on this uh, project, uh, the idea was uh, we were first interested in understanding the basic hemodynamic response uh, associated with auditory tasks. So back then, there, of course, there are tons of study related to EEG auditory tasks, but really there was not much about FNIRS. There was, but not much. So first, we wanted to kind of establish the foundation of uh, basic hemodynamic responses associated with auditory, uh, auditory tasks. And then in the second uh, phase, we were interested in understanding the relationship between the slow and fast oscillatory activity. And in the third phase, we were interested in combining these two modalities together to see how much it can improve the classification. And then in the fourth stage, we were interested in identifying the signatures of auditory response associated with uh, schizophrenia. Because um, in a, so generally, the, in other, the for example, here I will be talking about 40 hertz amplitude modulated white noise that has been shown that there is a lot of um, auditory response in healthy adults. Uh, but in schizophrenia, you see a lot of disruption in that frequency of uh, fre frequency of 40 hertz. So the idea was identifying the multimodal signatures uh, that are differentiated from healthy participants. And now, uh, now uh, actually, within past several months, we have been reporting from schizotyp participants, which is a subcategory of schizophrenia. We are still in the recruitment process. We are doing the um, uh, data analysis. Uh, but I, that was not my, my focus of the talk today. So I just wanted to give you a brief background about schizotypy and schizophrenia as well. That's why generally auditory, we, we started uh, focusing on auditory. But anyway, so let's go back. So we did uh, the recording from 11 healthy participants. We record, we placed the optodes and electrodes in three regions of interest. Here you can see the frontal left auditory and right auditory, which are regions of uh, interest for auditory tasks. The um, a simulation was 40 hertz amplitude modulated white noise click trends that were about uh, represented about 15 seconds and then silenced about 15 seconds. We had 72 of each of these blocks and we utilize TCCA GLM approach to make sure that we got uh, rid of the artifactual components as much as we could. 
and then we build uh, our, our uh, coupling analysis based on a phase amplitude coupling or PAC algorithm proposed by TORC in 2010. So the idea here in uh, PAC analysis is how the phase of the slow hemodynamic response is modulating the amplitude of the fast oscillatory activity in EEG. So again, how phase of a slow hemodynamic response is modulating the fast oscillatory activity recorded by EEG. And basically this pack is kind of uh, capturing this relationship. Uh, so the, the way that this algorithm works, we do band pass fil uh, filter, narrow band for EEG, and then F nearest we did, we, uh, so you can see from, for EEG between 5 to 55 hertz, for F nearest between 0 0.06 to 0 0.5 hertz. We throw Hilbert transform, we extracted instantaneous amplitude and phase from EEG and FNIRS respectively, and then we built the distribution, the phase distribution, amplitude distribution, and then uh, through that, that distribution, we gave it to a callback laser uh, divergence uh, algorithm to see how much it deviates from the uniform distribution. So the more deviate uh, there is between the obtained distribution, from the uniform distribution, the more pack or coupling or modulation index is there. So again, the more deviant is from uh, the, the more deviation is from the uniform, the more modulation index or the more pack is there. So this is the way that based on the, this modulation index, this based on this distance, kind of we uh, uh, quantified this coupling between the uh, slow hemodynamic and fast uh, electrical activities. And then through some non-parametric permutation cluster analysis, we built the surrogate data, we did the statistical analysis, we identified the significant uh, pack clusters, and then here is the results. So you can see here is the on the left side, uh, you can see clusters of T-value maps before TCCA regressor removal, and on the right side is after TCCA regressor removal. So this is very interesting, just to get a little more into, uh, into it. On the left side, you can see a very high uh, gamma pack is happening in the frontal, some happening in the left auditory and a little happening in the right auditory. So the frontal part was, <coughs> sorry, was very suspicious for us because there was like a very, very huge coupling happening there. On the, in the meantime, uh, so these were, these were before still applying the TCCA regressor. This is, these are before, like even uh, uh, identifying that maybe respiration is the deriving factor to that coupling. So on a separate analysis, we actually explore the relationship between the respiration EEG, the relationship between the respiration and ethnias, and we saw yes. So respiration is highly associated uh, with EEG and FNIR separately, and we speculated that can be the driving factor for this coupling. And actually, there might be some spurious coupling that is happening because of that respiration. And then after the TCCA uh, regressor removal, we ob uh, observed that, yes, so a lot of these coupling have been phased and have been removed, and some left, which makes sense. So you can see in the frontal, we are seeing some uh, frontal gamma pack, which is kind of expected because uh, the auditory study, so the simulation, if you remember, it's happening about 40 hertz. So we expect that in 40 hertz, there's something happening. And yes, so there is a coupling happening basically at that uh, frequency of uh, interest. And on the left auditory, you are seeing also in gamma, uh, some milder coupling happening that can be associated with rapid uh, acoustic processing because there is a rapid stimulation, auditory stimulation, uh, click train. So that left auditory coupling can be associated with that rapid acoustic processing. And on the right, right side, you can see alpha beta that we speculate can be associated with anticipation uh, and the prediction of the incoming uh, sound. But that this was 
over the whole data. So later on, we were kind of interested in seeing purely when the participant is listening to the stimulation click train, what is happening. So basically during only the task, uh, when the participant is actively listening to the stimulation click train, uh, we observe that there is a decoupling happening in the frontal, in the same similar gamma frequency, uh, which kind of makes sense because when the participants are listening to some fast click trains so in EEG you will see a very high oscillatory activity meaning that EEG is kind of getting synchronized with that uh, incoming oscillatory activity which is pretty fast but on the other side FMIRS is very slow and it cannot catch up basically and it does not get coupled with that fast oscillatory activity and that's actually the reason that is this kind of decoupling is happening between these two responses but on the other side we saw that in like alpha beta here you can see that uh, there is a coupling happening between these two responses that interestingly this alpha beta can be associated with attention, meaning that when there is some attention cognitive component involved uh, between EEG and FMIR, these, these responses can get coupled together uh, because of this attention uh, mechanism. And on the other side, when there is purely sensory responses happening, uh, because of that synchronization that is happening between the EEG and the auditory uh, steady state stimulation, so this decoupling happening between these two responses. So overall, we observed that there is a high coupling between the gamma and respiration. There was a high coupling between the gamma and FMIRS uh, before applying the TCCA uh, regressor removal, which we speculate that a good amount of this was because of the respiration. That was the deriving factor for this coupling. And then after applying the TCC uh, regressor removal, we observed still there is a gamma uh, frontal activity, which we kind of expect to be associated with the auditory SD SD stimulation. And in the left auditory cortex, we, uh, we saw a coupling that can be associated with the rapid acoustic processing and the frontal gamma uh, decoupling and frontal alpha and beta attentional coupling during the task. So when the participant was purely listening to, to the task, there was a different mechanism of coupling and decoupling uh, between these two responses associated with pure uh, sensory processing and cognitive processing. Uh, future work, we can consider time lag uh, differences between the EEG and FMIRS because here in this pack analysis, we did not take into account the, uh, the any sort of time lag between these two responses. Other type of cross-frequency coupling, like how phase of uh, FMIRS is modulating phase of EEG or how amplitudes are coupled together could be another interesting avenue to explore. Another interesting angle is the FNIR subbands of interest. So I know that, that FNIR is pretty low. So in a separate study, we kind of showed that when we uh, separate the FNIRs in bands of interest, like two or three bands of interest, like very uh, uh, slow oscillatory activity or low oscillatory activity, um, each of these bands of interest can contribute separately and can have different features. So that can be another angle uh, that potentially uh, we can uh, pursue in the future. So this was the first phase of my talk. And in the second phase of my talk, I would like to F uh, introduce FNIRSNET, uh, which is a novel multi-view spatial temporal convolutional neural network that we are specifically using for data fusion for auditory events. And we this is this is actually uh, an, a, a novel um, deep learning data fusion model we have been working for the past several uh, months in my lab. And uh, I will be showing uh, how we constructed this model and the results, the outcomes from this algorithm. And this algorithm is specifically for FNIRS. And then later on, I will be showing how merging this uh, FNIRS net with EEG uh, deep neural network can improve the classification performance. Okay, so shall I go ahead or? If there is any question. Yeah, I think you're you're good to keep going. Uh, okay. Yes, I, I think you're good to keep going. Okay, we'll sure. take questions at the end. Sure, sure. 
Okay, so in this, the second phase of the, uh, my talk, as I mentioned, I want to introduce FNRs net. So the way that FNRs net is working is it leverages the multi-view representations of neural responses, specifically a spatial and temporal dynamics. And then it, uh, through a fusion model, it fuses these different dynamics or different views together. And eventually we integrated with EEG network uh, to see how much the multimodal uh, scenario can improve the classification performance. So here you can see a very simple uh, perspective of a chair that you can see the, this, this chair can have different perspectives, can have different views. So from, although it's a chair, it's, it's just one single chair, you can have different views, you can have different features from this chair. So it's the same idea of multi-view is happening to the neural data. So in terms of our neural data, we were specifically interested in two views of a spatial and temporal dynamics, and then seeing how if we look at a spatial dynamic is different from temporal dynamic and how when we are merging them together, how it can improve the classification performance. So the auditory data is similar. It's not the same exactly because here we wanted to build kind of a two class problem where the participants, so while the participants had that 40 hertz stimulation click trains, there was some oddball uh, paradigm that was kind of uh, merged into the auditory SAD stimulation protocol. And the reason, as I mentioned, we wanted to kind of create two uh, different types of classes. So the way that this oddball paradigm works, so we have deviant uh, stimuli, which is basically the target or the rare event, and we have a standard stimuli, which is a non-target uh, or the non-rare event. And we were asking the participants to mentally count uh, the number of deviants as the deviants were happening. So the uh, a standard was a one kilohertz tones, which lasts about 500 milliseconds, you can see here. And then the deviant was the same 500 millisecond, but uh, a 40 hertz uh, click train uh, uh, that were basically uh, amplitude modulated white noise. Uh, so the inter uh, stimulus interval, interval was about two seconds, and we made sure that the, the distance between two uh, consequent deviant, as you can see here with purple, is about 15 seconds or even more to make sure that the FNIR's hemodynamic response comes back to its uh, baseline, basically. Uh, so I don't want to go deep into the data pre-processing, simple data pre-processing, band pass filtering, artifact removal, epoching. So about the epoching, we did about two seconds for EEG, we did about 15 seconds for FNIRs, up sample, down sample. Uh, eventually, the dimension of the data, which was important for our algorithm, was uh, 2,760 trials for both EEG and FNIRs. For EEG, we had 15 channels, primarily located in the frontal, left auditory, and right auditory. And FNIRs had two 14 channels, 14 channels for uh, oxy and 14 channels for deoxy. And about the data point, we had 539 uh, data points for EEG and 150 data points uh, for FNIR. So this is basically the data that we gave to our model to construct our model. So before going to our model, just I want to show here a very nice uh, demonstration of oxygenated uh, hemoglobin uh, changes uh, uh, from two representative participants. You can see here we, the blue is deviant and the red is a standard. This is one participant. This is another participant. You can see a very nice uh, difference between the deviant and a standard, as we can see also in EEG. But the EEG tons of studies have been done, so that was not the focus of really this study. But we could see such a nice pattern uh, in deviant uh, compar uh, uh, compared with a standard. But there, is, there was important um, um, something important that we observed that uh, these responses are changing from participant to participants. For example, here you can see while there is some initial dip happening in, uh, for example, this participant uh, in the first five seconds, then there is a big uh, overshoot about uh, 10 to 15 seconds and it comes back to the baseline. But in the uh, other participant, there is no such uh, um, 
uh, reduce of the activity. So it goes, it has a high uh, overshoot and it happens earlier. It happens between five to 10 seconds. So you can see in terms of the latency and in terms of the, a little bit, the shape of the response, uh, they, are, they are different from person to person. So obviously we had nine participants here. I did not plot all of them, but these are just to demonstrate how they were, these responses were subject specific basically. Uh, so we used uh, four different inputs into our model, uh, uh, HBO2, HBR, and then we kind of in the last two input models, we uh, kind of merged them together in the parallel form. We merged the, them across the depth uh, dimension and in the merged one, we kind of concatenated across the channel. And the point was we wanted to see how much difference these different input types can uh, have into our model. Because again, this is the model that we are, we are kind of developing from A to Z. So we kind of need to be like exploratory, right? So we wanted to kind of see the, uh, how our model can be sensitive to different types of input types. Uh, so here is the general overview of our proposed model. So we have two blocks of, we call it view one and view two, which basically in view one, first the temporal analysis is happening and then a spatial analysis and view two is vice versa. Let me go to the next slide here, you can see in the temporal analysis, there is a, te there is a convolutional layer that is happening temporarily across the time. And the idea is it wants to capture the time dependent relationship and patterns uh, temporally. And in the spatial uh, uh, block, the convolution is, is, uh, is going especially across the channel to capture the spatial dependencies among the channels, among the regions. So these are basically two different perspectives or two different views that we kind of emphasize on and build our model. So in view one, first we uh, apply the temporal block and then a spatial block. And then in view two, we, we did vice versa. First, a spatial, uh, we, we captured the spatial dependencies and then temporal dependencies. We concatenated these features. We gave it to a fusion uh, module consisting of, again, a convolutional uh, layer, layer normalization, uh, activation function, which I don't want to talk about, but the score activation function actually had an important role in our data. And then the output of the fusion goes to the pooling, average pooling to reduce dimensionality and overfitting in a manner that is generally uh, computationally efficient. So this is basically for fusing. If we didn't want to go to the fusion, so we gave the view one and view two directly to the pooling block. So as you can see, it basically bypasses the fusion block. And then the classification, which is the, basically the uh, last stage. So the data set, the, the, the evaluation happened on three different data sets. And again, because this, is the, this was exploratory work, so we were kind of interested in understanding. Uh, the balancedness of the two classes because the class levels were heavily imbalanced and we were interested in seeing first how it works on balanced data and uh, how it can be tolerated to imbalancedness. So we kind of had two balanced scenarios in which uh, in the subject set, so we had a, a, a 102 Debian, 102 a standard, and in the balanced uh, set, we actually put all the subjects together. So we had 918 uh, standard, 918 deviants, uh, and in the complete, we've just put everything together. So a standard, remember, a standard were much more than Debian. So here in the balance, we're kind of randomly selecting a standards uh, to be equivalent to the Debian. But in the complete set, we're kind of just putting everything in the same pot uh, to create the imbalance scenario. So we adopted a robust evaluation approach by employing a two uh, stage five-fold cross-validation, basically to optimize and assess our model. Uh, specifically, uh, as you can see here, so the, in the first training phase, uh, the model underwent 200 epochs of training during which about 20% uh, of the data was used uh, for validation. And the primary objective of the first phase was to identify the best uh, performing model 
uh, based on minimum validation loss that we always do, okay? But in the second phase, so after we identify this uh, best performing model, in the second phase, we give this model to the second phase, which goes to another iteration, another 100 epochs. And in this phase, only 20% of the validation data from the previous step was used as validation, and the remaining was used for the training. So basically, we had more data uh, in, the, in the second stage to train our model. And ultimately, the final model used for evaluation of the test data was selected uh, based on the criteria of achieving, obviously, the minimum validation loss that we always uh, would like to see uh, in the second phase. So uh, to compare our model with other types of uh, uh, neural, deep neural network for ethmeres, we adopted three kind of uh, popular, and one of them is more recent, um, called shallow CNN, deep CNN, N2T CNN, that all are working based on convolutional neural networks similar to ours, and all are, are focused on spatial temporal dynamics. Uh, for EEG, we kind of adopted uh, pretty famous and recent also type of uh, neural network, uh, namely EEGnet, PCnet, Inception, and ITnet. And eventually, we merged them all together to see how much really this multimodal scenario can improve uh, their performance. So as you can see here, this figure uh, presents a comprehensive evaluation of our model for both views of view one, view two, and the fusion uh, scenario, when we fuse all uh, these two views together uh, with respect to all four different input types of uh, HBO2, HBR, parallel, and merge that I mentioned. So as a reminder, if you remember in view one and view two, uh, they were getting connected to the pulling module directly, bypassing that fusion module, meaning that there is no fusion happening in view one and view two. And you can see that substantially both views are lower than the fusion. Um, so you can see that while the fusion is more than view one, view two, view one is still is outperforming view two, highlighting the importance of the sequential analysis in which we first uh, adopted the, temp the temporal analysis identifying the temporal patterns, and then adopted the spatial analysis and identified the spatial uh, dependencies. So this kind of highlights that how these sequential manners are important. You can see in view one and view two, this uh, spatial and temporal analysis were kind of opposite. And you can see that actually our model like to first identify the temporal dependencies and then spatial dependencies, as opposed to first spatial and then temporal. And you can see here, for almost all four input types, the fusion uh, outperformed view one and view two. Uh, about the input type, we really did not see much difference. So you can see almost all these four input types are kind of competitive in the fusion. Um, while maybe we can say merge a little, you know, working better than the other one. one the other three ones. But overall, we did not see much um, uh, improvement. We can we can just maybe say maybe the merge is a little better, highlighting the importance of concatenating the data uh, across the uh, channels as opposed to the depth. Maybe that can be something that we can kind of explain, but we did not see really much difference in the input types. So when we are comparing our model with other type of uh, convolutional neural network, you can see in the balance set, uh, our model is outperforming the other three models. So we could achieve about 83% as opposed to 77, 68 for a shallow deep M2T CNN. Um, so uh, you can see that even a sensitivity and species, so these are all almost in the same range, and again, because the data was balanced. So among all of them, as you can see, FMIR's net is outperforming, while M2T uh, CNN is kind of competing with FMIR's net, although it is still low, but for example, deep and shallow, is, uh, they, are, they are much lower. 
In the subject set, this table presents actually a comprehensive evaluation of our model in the subject set when the data was smaller. So remember in the subject set, we were just dealing with a sample uh, from each subject separately, and we had nine subjects here. So again, FNIR's net here, it achieved the highest average accuracy, about 81%, whereas the shallow, the deep, and uh, M2TCNN obtained an average accuracy is about uh, 66, um, 69, and 75, as you can see. Uh, notably, FNIR's average performance on the subject level was slightly less than the balance. So let's go back to the balance. You can see in the balance is about 83%. Here is about 81%. And that was the case for other uh, uh, networks as well. In another note, you can see the standard deviation is much higher than the balance data, which can be indicative of the small sample size. So as you can see, as you, you know, and you can see deep learning models commonly benefit from large sample size. So that can basically a little explain the reason for slightly lower uh, accuracy and higher standard deviation. And when we, uh, compare it with uh, other modalities in the complete set where we had the whole imbalance scenario uh, from the deviance and a standard, we actually observed that uh, our model is pretty robust to the imbalanceness. So you can see the accuracy is about 91%, sensitivity 83, specificity 95. But for example, some of the networks like shallow and deep CNN, you can see like sensitivity is really not doing well while specificity is pretty high, meaning that they are kind of more tailored towards one of the classes rather than the other classes. For the M2TCNN, I can see that that was also pretty competitive. And in terms of it could have handle the imbalanceness of our data, but still it was inferior to the FNIR's performance. And this figure is actually nicely demonstrating, a, it's a two-dimensional visualization of the output data uh, belonging to two classes of Debian and a standard. And you can see in the view one and view two, there are, the classes are really not much separable, um, which can explain the inferior accuracy, inferior performance, and as soon as we hit the fusion block and the dense, which is the, the, the last uh, block, you can see much nicer separation is happening between these two classes, basically highlighting the important role of fusion and basically the dense layer at the end. Uh, here are the comparisons across the EEG networks and the TC net we observed that working the best, uh, while the other models are slightly uh, working uh, worse than TC net. But TC net, I mean, almost all of them kind of similar, uh, while TC net was slightly better than the other ones. And then eventually, ultimately, when we put everything in the same pod, uh, we said, okay, so now what's the performance when we have single model EEG, we have multi, uh, we have single model FNIRs, and we have, when we are combining all these together, uh, you can see that uh, when our model here is FNIRs net in the pink, uh, purple, uh, that is being combined with TC net, that is achieving the highest performance. So you can see that the last column for all of them is basically FNIR's net, okay? So for example, here FNIR's net is uh, being combined with EEG net. Here is being combined with inception, for example. Here FNIR's net is alone, and uh, here is different types of EEG networks. So you can see when FNIR's net is alone, so it's in the fusion, the multi-view perspective, it's working better than the other uh, types of uh, uh, convolutional neural networks. However, when it is being merged with other type of EEG networks, it is kind of outperforming in multimodal scenarios and the best performance is happening uh, when it is combined with TCNet. So it kind of uh, highlight first the important role of FNIRS net on classifying FNIRS alone and then important compatibility with TCNet to, for an enhanced multimodal uh, classification, basically. 
So the ongoing and future work that actually currently we are observing uh, some dub double decent phenomena in our uh, optimization procedure that I did not talk here. We are in, still in the process of investigation and writing. Actually, we want to uh, uh, publish that uh, we are observing uh, some double descent phenomena in our um, uh, optimization function. And uh, usually we kind of um, get happy with the first descent, the first minimal in our objective function and say, okay, that's the, that's the uh, optimal point. But actually we are observing that's not the truth. So there might be other uh, minimal that actually have less uh, error and kind of uh, can improve their performance, uh, meaning that maybe if we have like a kind of uh, over parameterized uh, network, this could enhance learning even on a small data set, which is very important for neural data because a lot of time we, are, we don't have access to large or big data. The second aspect that uh, we're kind of working is on explainability. Uh, we are keen on advancing towards incorporating more explainable uh, uh, artificial intelligence network uh, to have a more comprehensive model and better understanding of the data. A lot of time these deep learning models can be kind of blind and me working on signal processing a lot. So I'm kind of like very particular about understanding like first the neural dynamics and how this model is evolving towards addressing those neural dynamics. So obviously the goal is developing transparent and trustworthy algorithms. And the third uh, is the nonlinear representations. I did not talk here, but uh, we observed that activation functions actually have very important role. Uh, so for our case, uh, we adopted the score activation function, but uh, different types of activation functions can have different um, basic adaptability to the data. So depending on the data type, uh, uh, the activation function can have very important role in determining the efficacy of the algorithm. Uh, here are our grants that we have been supported by, and I will take any question if you have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Shariari. That was that was wonderful, and thanks for sharing um, all, all this data with us. Um, the floor is open for questions. So we did get a question during the presentation. We'll start with that first. Um, I can read the question out for you. So it says, at some point, you can talk. Uh, can you talk more about your understanding of the mechanism behind the frontal gamma decoupling you observed? So this is referring to the results in the slide just before the um, F nearest net part. Uh, yes. Actually, this is uh, one moment. Yes, so this is actually, we are very, we actually published this too. Um, it is kind of our research, recent, one of our recent publications. Uh, we are actually very excited about this because um, a lot of this research can be really biased towards like for example there they, they have some claim of oh there is a high coupling happening between these two okay but really in uh, there in real scenario there are some other underlying mechanisms that can be deriving factor for such a for example relationship or coupling specifically in our case we observe a very high coupling is happening in the gamma so generally just to give you a brief background about gamma gamma is very important in the auditory uh, simulation tasks okay so when we originally designed our experimental protocol back in 2019 2020 uh, this 40 hertz gamma has been it's, it's a very well known phenomenon specifically in eeg and uh, there are tons of studies that they are showing this um, high, high frequency gamma happening, specifically in the frontal part. So that's something that is well known, okay? But in FNIRS, it's not. So FNIRS is like much less studied. And that's why we wanted first to establish the foundation of the, this basic auditory hemodynamic responses. But then further, when you wanted to kind of quantify this interaction, we saw there is a coupling. And first we got excited, you know, and say, oh, wow, this like, 
so this can be something that describe you know the the uh, the this synchronization of the EEG with uh, high oscillatory activity happening and uh, like maybe there are some mechanisms and but, but why they are getting coupled together? What's the reason? Why it is so strong? And that made us like kind of suspicious to go back all the way to uh, see maybe there are other physiological mechanisms involved. And then we observed, yes, so there is respiration. So we did a separate uh, basically uh, analysis and we observed that respiration is purely coupled with EEG, respiration is purely coupled with FMIRS, and yes, maybe, we're not 100% sure, but uh, that can be a deriving factor for such a high coupling. And that's why we developed all those PCCA regressor removal. After that, we still see frontal gamma, okay? So again, frontal gamma is important, as I mentioned. So tons of EEG studies they are showing, but such a high coupling was a little suspicious. So after removing that such a coupling, still we are seeing such a high gamma frontal, which can basically explain the task because the task is actually happening in the 40 hertz gamma. So it kind of explains there is a coupling happening when uh, during auditory tasks, and uh, this was across the entire data, so silence and task all together. There is a general coupling happening between these two responses, basically. Perfect, thank you. Um, we got a couple more questions related to setup. So, um, and actually, we got some questions during the registration as well, a lot, um, you know, along those lines. So, uh, maybe we can take all those questions together. So, the first one is which EEG system did you use? Can you share any tips regarding effective setup of EEG and FNIRS? Um, and the second question is, did you use wet or dry EEG electrodes, again, related to the same system? And did you face any problems when it came to simultaneous recording? Um, so again, related to signal quality. So GUSB amp is what we are using, two 16 channel GUSB amp, sometimes just one of them because sometimes we don't need uh, high density data. Um, it depends on the type because we are doing different types of, you know, experimental protocol. So I think for this specific study, we used only one of them, GUSB AMP, and we, it was kind of, so we, uh, uh, in terms of first, the, the devices need to be triggered together, and then the, the uh, experimental design need to be in a way that we have the indication of the, when the task is happening, so that later on in our Offline analysis, when we do, we can we have to have that in those indications of the happening of the event on both EEG and FNIRS. So we have to, the point is we have to make sure both systems are recording simultaneously, specifically EEG being so uh, sensitive to what like we're talking about millisecond about EEG. So it's very important that uh, a start point should exactly synchronize together which is also important in the experimental. So the experimental design needs to be in a way that kind of provokes both activities at the same time uh, simultaneously. Uh, yes, we did dry as well, but dry was very noisy. So we decided just to stick with wet electrodes, and uh, but it has its own challenges, you know, the gel, the contamination with uploads and all these things, you need to be careful. So it was pretty challenging, I would say, for the first few months to figure out all these small details. But in terms of the montage, if uh, anyone interested in just seeing how we are doing the montage, we have done many different types of studies and we have many different types, different papers. So you can take a look at our papers, okay? For example, for auditory, we are focusing on frontal, left auditory, right auditory. For example, we have motor imagery that we are focusing on the frontal and central and parietal, you know, sensory, pre, motor, primary. So it really depends on the type of the task that we are doing, but based on that, that basically we, have, we are designing our experimental protocol carefully to be able to, to make sure that we are we are recording the response of interest as much as we could. Perfect, thank you. And uh, we can share, if there's any specific publications, we can share with all the attendees as well afterwards um, that, that you would like to, that you're referring to. Perfect. Um, so a couple more questions, if, if it's okay, we'll just uh, go a few minutes over time just to answer the questions in the chat. Um, so the uh, question is regarding the TCC GLM. Um, so does it incorporate the source of physiological noise, for example, the cardiac signal, and is the code package and currently available? Yes, so uh, we actually kind of uh, adopted the algorithm from the Boone Lopeman group. I can ask my PhD student that he kind of um, 
updated the algorithm in a way that we uh, had to kind of you know bring out the respiration uh, into the model. Uh, yes, I, I think we can make it accessible if anyone is interested in. Um, so the the point about that was because we had respiration separately. So it's just a little, it was a little, so we had to kind of that Z uh, that I showed you in the formula, the TCCA. So that basically needs to be constructed using the short channel and the respiration together, uh, which was not a big deal, but you know, so something that we had to consider. And yes, yeah, so I can ask my PhD student who was working on this to make the code available if anyone is interested in. Perfect, thank you. And the last question we have is, um, during real time recording of EEG and FNIRS, achieving a return to baseline for the hemodynamic response can be challenging. Could you share rec your recommendations for designing experiments in real life settings that accommodate or mitigate this issue? Yes, that's that's why I'm saying the experimental design is very important because, for example, in EEG, we want to be fast, right? So we don't want to go more than like two seconds. We don't care about it. But in FMIRS, we can't. And um, the very beginning, we started with like 20 seconds, but then we kind of reduced, reduced, reduced. So we can say the sweet point is about 15 seconds, 12 to 15 seconds that we can see the hemodynamic response comes back to its baseline. However, 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 in one of the publications, I actually we utilize the FNIRS as communication systems. So FNIRS and EEG, we merge them together for communication and for the purpose of communication. You all know that uh, speed is very important, right? So you cannot like wait 20 seconds to just like spell one character, okay? So in that, that paper, actually, I think we published 2018, that is purely communication. Uh, we were uh, able to extract only features from the first, I think, two seconds of FNIRS, two to three seconds of FNIRS. And we showed that they, they are uh, useful enough to be able to use as assistive technology because over there we were interested in in developing assistive technology for a patient in later stage ALS that they were they were completely locked and not able to even work much with EEG and we showed actually FNIRS can be very helpful in communication over there so uh, we were able to get a few first few seconds up but that's that's what just just for feature extraction sake, sake of feature extraction you know but uh, if you are really like working on understanding a comprehensive evaluation, so I would recommend just give enough time for the hemodynamic response to come back to to come back to its baseline. Perfect. Thank you very much, and thank you for your time and for joining us today. So we did get a few questions as well during the registration process. So just for the interest of time, what we will do is uh, maybe we'll get you to answer so answer them offline, and then we'll share your responses with our with I our will users. Be happy. Perfect. Thank you. And uh, again, a copy of this recording will be made available in a few days on our website and any publications you would share with us, we will, we will forward to all the attendees as well. Sure. Um, okay. So I can, I can just share, uh, I, I can give my email address and I can share uh, my lab website and you got, uh, anyone can take a look and the publications are available over there. Wonderful. That is perfect. Thank you so much, Dr. Okay, Chavira, again you, for your time. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks everyone take for care. joining us. Have, Have a good, good one. Bye. 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 Bye.